Hello and welcome back. We are talking about uh, the cognitive effect of bilingualism as in how bilingualism can have an impact on the way we deal with uh, various kinds of incoming stimulus and how we are capable of inhibiting the goal irrelevant cues. Uh, from that perspective, we have looked at different kinds of tasks that build in those kind, the different kinds of conflict and thereby we have looked at how conflict monitoring and conflict resolution by utilizing inhibition of various types is more salient, is more common to find among bilinguals as opposed to monolinguals. And then now we move on to cognitive aging in terms of various kinds of decline that we see, cognitive decline that we see among elderly population. So, in terms of uh, when we compare between um, adults and older adults as in uh, elderly population, we see certain amount of decline in various cognitive capabilities. Their processing speed goes down, their memory starts to, uh, starts to shrink, then there will be inhibitory deficits and also various sensory functions also decline. This decline includes decline in language capacities also quite often, if not always quite often language decline, uh, decline in linguistic capacities accompany these. So, as a result we see um, uh, onset of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and various other such um, uh, diseases among the elderly population. So, when we when somebody is suffering from Alzheimer's or um, Parkinson's sometimes dementia language get getting affected is a very common sign. Now, this is this is quite common, this is um, nearly universal that cognitive decline accompanies old age. Now, throughout our lifetime the brain goes through various kinds of changes finally resulting in decline in old age. So, that is common and understandable. However, it seems there are certain cases when the cognitive decline can, ha can be thwarted to some extent if not entirely stopped or in other words cognitive decline may not affect every person in the same way. Sometimes even though the brain has gone through its usual course of action going through neurodegeneration at an advanced age, however, the patients may not always show the results, the resultant behavioral changes so to say resultant behavioral decline in our in linguistic decline and so on. So, there have been various studies to find out what exactly are the components, what exactly are the contributing factors towards one to have the cognitive decline, second to have the manifestation of the cognitive decline. What are the factors that could be uh, understood to be contributing factors? So, one study of this type goes back to all the way to 1981 when they looked at patients suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and they found that there possibly are some kind of social connections to Alzheimer's and, uh, and dementia. One study particularly on Chinese older patients the, that was based on 5000 patients found out that education probably could be an important predictor. They connected the education level of the um, participants with the onset of dementia. So, higher the education level lower the chances of uh, being uh, suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and so on. So, manifestation is the key word here. So, whether or not you have a, a neurodegeneration, but whether that will manifest in some kind of a visible disorder is what is the core focus here and that that is somehow connected to education that is what the study on Chinese older population found out. In some cases, in some patients Alzheimer's was discovered only in autopsy meaning that those people did not manifest any sign of Alzheimer's during their lifetime. However, on autopsy it was found that their brain did have all the, uh, all the components that typically are associated with Alzheimer's. So, there, that means there is something else that is happening. So, it is not a direct connection, direct one to one mapping between the brain neurodegeneration and the manifestation of the diseases. There is some kind of a filtering mechanism that probably helps 
in some cases. So, what are those mechanisms? What probably could be happening? There are two main theses in this uh, domain that talks about what probably stops some person, some elderly people from manifesting those uh, telltale signs. So, the damage do not basically all the patients uh, with brain damage do not manifest the uh, disease similarly. So, the two theories primarily deal with one theory deals with the brain reserve, the idea of brain reserve, the other theory deals with cognitive reserve. We will not dwell too much on the brain reserve, we will just see what it means. So, the brain reserve theorists uh, propose that some people, some individuals have higher number of synapses or let us say more number of redundant brain networks, redundant neuronal networks. That is basically taking to us to the structural properties of the brain. So, some people might have higher number of synapses, higher number of networks which comes to their rescue when the need be. So, that is basically a hard, uh, uh, hardware problem, hardware issue and that is called brain reserve. On the other hand, there is this theory called brain cognitive reserve. Now, cognitive reserve talks about the software issue as in how the same networks can be trained to do difficult things, to do uh, difficult ta challenging tasks is what cognitive reserve is all about. So, the people with higher educational uh, level or any kind of higher attainment typically are found to have higher cognitive strategies. What this basically means is uh, this takes us back to the idea of spillover effect. Anybody who has uh, you know who goes through their life using their brain to solve challenging cognitive problems, their brain up their brains network differently, their brain, their neuronal networks fire differently, they have different kinds of connections created and there are different strategies to solve different problems. So, that is what basically is cognitive reserve all about. So, typically you will find this among people who are, um, who have some amount of high attainment in any domain of high achievement. So, any domain of high achievement automatically presupposes that your brain has been busy solving numerous problems within that domain itself, numerous complex problems and only when you face challenges and solve them do you come up successful. So, success has a um, has a repercussion at in, in terms of your cognitive reserve. So, this is a primarily cognitive uh, a software issue with respect to your cognitive apparatus. So, now let us uh, look into in more detail about cognitive reserve. So, what does it do? When we say that uh, a person with higher educational attainment or higher attainment in any other uh, domain like music or any other sports uh, and so on, what happens? What happens is this, they fine tune the ability to optimize or maximize performance of different neuronal networks through differential recruitment of brain networks, right. So, this reflect in the use of alternate cognitive strategies. Basically meaning that we train when we expose ourselves to different difficult task demands, our brain neuronal networks are challenged and as a result of which two things probably happen. One is we can use different networks to solve similar kind of problem or we can use the same task for different kinds of problems. So, basically a lot of rewiring happens. So, we are able to and as a result of which those people are able to maximize or optimize their the network that they have at their disposal. Now, this is nothing new, this is not uh, anything new that we are talking about, this has been already there. So, changes in the brain recruitment happens throughout our life that is that is almost common knowledge because uh, as we go through life facing different kinds of challenges brain uh, simultaneously changes. So, brain recruitment associated with reserve are a normal response to tab increased task demands. Any kind of increased task demands will, will have a response system from the brain and as a result of which there will be uh, changes. So, this reserve is present in both healthy individuals as well as people with brain damage that is a given that is already the premise. Now, in a sense an individual who uses a brain network more efficiently or is more capable of calling up alternate brain networks or cognitive strategies in response to high demand may have higher cognitive reserve. So, this is basically what goes on behind the scene. 
when we see somebody practicing music for years together or somebody exercising for years together or facing different kinds of challenges in even in games with of various types for example you take the case of football or rugby or cricket or all of these are strategy dependent activities and one needs to constantly have a feedback system in your brain depending on what the other players are doing so you need to update so this kind of t this is this is exactly where the difference between a good player and a bad player is so because of these uh, different strategies to put in place over a period of time this is what happens so this kind of people they use brain networks more efficiently and often they can use alternate networks for the same kind of purpose and various kinds of this um, fine tuning of this mechanism so to to finally boil it down to two main points this cognitive reserve typically means that using the same network for more number of purposes and utilizing different cognitive paradigms for the same task right so this is basically what it all means now as a result of more use of different cognitive mechanisms these individuals tend to create more cognitive reserve for their old age because if you have continuously uh, done this kind of challenging tasks all your life you are basically creating cognitive reserve for your old age now as a result of which this creates some amount of immunity in terms of cognitive immunity so uh, which which will help you in term in in the face of brain damage as we all know um, in in childhood if you play in different you know uh, you just go out in the out in the open outdoors and play in the outdoors the more a child's immune system is exposed to different kind of um, uh, stimulus the more the child's uh, immune system will be strengthened it is similar it is something like that it is something similar to like that so the the more challenges the brain faces the more the immune system will get strengthened and the more it will in turn be uh, provide uh, it will provide resilience in face in the face of brain damage so this is probably what happens or what has been happening for various kinds of um, those patients who have not manifested the disease so this is basically the kind of spillover effect we have talked about earlier now the question is can this kind of cognitive reserve be connected to bilingualism too is, is bilingualism also an equally challenging task that is probably uh, that could contribute to having higher cognitive reserve now we have already seen that many elderly pop, uh, elderly participants in different 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 uh, task conditions have done better than younger bilinguals uh, who are equally proficient so we already have seen that elderly population do uh, have a certain amount of control mechanism at their disposal now we want to see whether that kind of control mechanism in terms of reserve also has an impact in uh, against or some kind of immunity against the different kinds of neurodegenerative diseases so this is what we are trying to see now now there have been various studies on this um, by different groups of researchers we will uh, talk about a couple of them here so one particular study in 2007 by uh, by listox group they uh, looked into the hospital records and uh, compared the age of onset of symptoms of of um, there are 91 monolinguals and 93 bilinguals with dementia and alzheimer's disease so basically um, now the problem one uh, issue let me clear before we get into this more is that typically this kind of patients the alzheimer parkinson's dementia patients most of the studies have uh, been dependent on hospital records so when they visited the hospital after they had been uh, uh, for diagnosis so when they have been diagnosed when there was their first hospital visit is what the focus has been in this study they found out and the comparison was between 91 monolinguals and 93 bilinguals who all suffered from dementia majority from alzheimer's disease so the results showed that the age of onset of dementia is 4 years later for bilinguals than the monolinguals so on an average the bilinguals had reported a later onset of the disease as opposed to monolinguals who had reported an earlier onset of the same disease now the gap is um in this particular study the gap was found out to be 4 years which is quite significant 
the two groups were otherwise essentially equivalent on other measures like uh, mental state examiner, occupational status and so on um, because those things need to be controlled so that they are not contributing variables. So, the finding in this case is that bilingualism probably has an impact, probably has a some amount of immunity in the face of mental cognitive disorders. Another interesting thing in this particular study was that monolingual group had higher number of education also in uh, comparison with bilingual groups. So, even though the monolinguals had higher education, the bilinguals were showing better immunity in the face of Alzheimer's and dementia. In another study, uh, there was this study in the, done in 2010 with 100 monolingual and 100 bilingual patients who had all of whom had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in this sample too, the first clinic visit by the patients were uh, had, a, had shown a gap of 4 years. So, the monolinguals visited the clinic 4 years earlier than the bilinguals. And also bilingual groups experienced symptoms of dementia 5 years later. There is a slight uh, difference here between when you start experiencing the problem versus when you visit the hospital. In This is not same in every country. In many European countries or in the, in the US and other places like that, their hospital visits are typically earlier compared to uh, the same patients let us say in India or uh, other Asian countries. So, that is one. So, hospital visit is one. Another is when you start experiencing the problem. So, in this study, they have, they have also taken into account the when they started, when the patient started experiencing symptoms of dementia and they found that same kind of difference. So, experiencing dementia started 5 years earlier for monolinguals compared to bilinguals and the hospital visit or clinic visit was also different by 4 years. However, there was no difference between subgroups of immigrant versus non-immigrant. There was no difference on this count. So, these studies demonstrate that bilingualism with its high demand for establishing and maintaining two linguistic system probably contribute to cognitive reserve. So, lifetime of practicing bilingualism seems to have an impact in this domain too. So, now we have seen a lot of areas within uh, different kinds of uh, mental uh, functioning starting from children, childhood to adulthood to elderly population and on various parameters bilingualism seem to have a positive impact. However, the story only begins here and it gets a lot more interesting because there are lots and lots of disagreements. While on the one hand we have a large number of uh, available empirical data that suggests a positive impact of bilingualism in terms of executive control, uh, inhibition, working memory and so on basically in various domains within the higher order um, intelligence. However, there are also studies that did not find the same kind of benefit. The basic idea here is the basic difference here is that there have been studies there have been replications of those studies who have found the advantage, but the replications failed to find the advantage. So, there have been some studies that reported null result and some studies that reported an absolutely no advantage whatsoever. In fact, there have been some studies that even, even have a correlation of negative um, uh, there have been a negative correlation as well. So, a number of uh, studies have come out in 19, late uh, in last uh, about 8-9 years. Um, one of them was uh, starting with 2011, uh, a meta-analysis meta came up, um, came out by Hilche and Klein and uh, following that there have been a number of studies and uh, taken together they all have raised a number of uh, issues with the findings and these are some of them that I have pointed out here. So, there are very many issues, issues with respect to participants, issues with respect to task designs, issues with respect to the population, issues with respect to various other kinds of mechanisms that are all part of the previous studies. So, one of them is which component of EC is influenced by bilingualism is not clear. So, while we know that there have been findings, positive findings in terms of working memory, in terms of other various other 
uh, domains, but there has been a lot of uh, data that also show that not all of them can be verifiable. So, in some studies you find a positive correlation, another study you find a negative correlation. So, that raises the question as to which aspect of executive control actually mimics a bilingual's handling of the two languages. Typically, the findings have suggested that because bilinguals handle two languages simultaneously at various levels of conflict, hence there should be a uh, direct correlation between executive, various executive control mechanisms. But many of these studies fail to explicitly say as to which part of executive control is a direct replica of a bilingual handling his or her two languages. That is exactly where the one of the problems is. So, the components of EC is one important issue that has been raised. Another is on the clarity on the exact nature of neuronal control mechanism. Neuronal control mechanisms have been found to be um, have getting some amount of positive impact. However, there, there are questions on that too. Now, in today's time when we have much finer uh, neuronal uh, brain mapping mechanisms, there are many questions, new questions also that have been asked. Similarly, there are new findings that have pointed out that domain general and language specific cognitive control areas in the brain probably are not the same areas. Earlier the idea was that large area in the prefrontal cortex are responsible for both domain general cognitive control as well as linguistic language control uh, functions. But now new findings have pointed out that they that may not be the case. In fact, there are proposals that there are two different areas which lie side by side which are near to each other but they are not the same area. So that is that is also adding to the debate. And another thing, uh, one more point is that reduplica replication failures typically happen most of the time with behavioral data. So, behavioral tasks like Simon and uh, ANT and various other tasks, more, more disagreements have been found in the uh, experiments that have used behavioral experiments rather than in the neural, uh, in the brain mapping mechanisms. Though there are disagreements there too, but larger number of um, replication failure have come from behavioral experiments. And then of course, there is task impurity. So, there are fine Minor nuances within each task as to how much of that task design actually targets the control mechanism. So, that is again a very uh, important issue that has been pointed out. Larger socio-cultural issues are also a new uh, variable that have been pointed out many by many researchers. Uh, last few years have seen a new uh, social turn in psycholinguistics research, social turn as in um, researchers are now beginning to look into the socio-cultural background of the population in order to take them into account while processing various kinds of um, uh, stimulus. So, the psychological studies or psychological linguistic studies of various kinds of um, language control mechanism have started to take into account the social variables. So, that is another thing that was not considered before. So, within the social variables, there are many issues that have now started being looked at. Uh, we, we talked about the Swedish, Iranian and Iranian Kurdish and Iranian Persian population, Iranian um, Turkish population and we saw how migrant, non-migrant difference has come out. Similarly, differences have also been pointed in terms of socio-economic status. So, in, one has to keep that as a control. So, socio-economic status can also prove to be an important variable cultural closeness is yet another. So, whereas we find a lot of difference in terms of lots of um, impact of the incongruent condition in case of Chinese English bilinguals, the same kind of um, Im impact in incongruent condition is not probably possible in language groups that are cult culturally close. Then linguistic distance is yet another factor. Again, going back to the Iranian study where they found that when the language pair are linguistically close, the results are completely different when compared to when the language pairs are different, linguistically different, structurally different. So, there are so many other areas also that have that have now come up as a 
probable confounding variables. And in case of aging as well, in case of cognitive aging as well, the newer studies have uh, pointed out that hospital records probably may not be a very reliable source of data. That, that because the entire study is based on hospital records and uh, interviewing caregivers and so on, probably there are more objective methods that are necessary. So there have been uh, all of these different uh, criticism, different types of criticism that have been levied on the bilingual advantage theory and as a result of which we now have a lot of new, um, uh, new way of looking at these um, uh, things. In this, this effect. In case of children, though the results are more or less, uh, more or less universal, there are uh, less problematic data. Uh, more often than not, there have been more agreement in the case of child child's data. However, there are still some who did not find the same effect. Um, one of them is Anton, 19, uh, 2014 study which uh, did not find the same kind of uh, bilingual advantage for children using an ANT uh, that is um, attentional network task. And last but not the least, a number of researchers have also pointed out uh, publication bias. In meaning publication bias is part of any academic discipline. Publication bias basically refers to the tendency of a particular kind of finding to be published whereas the contrary finding may not be published. So up till um, there are studies which have uh, there are meta studies meta analysis that have pointed out that after 2014 more studies have been published that have um, not found the impact as opposed to before that. So there were before 2014 there was a number of studies came out and all of them seem to be showing the advantage. Now if you look at it, look at the finding from the lens of publication bias, you know that the only the positive results were published, negative results were not published. So these are some of the criticism some of the problems that have been pointed out in last few year, years nine, uh, starting 2011 till today last 10 years have seen a lot of debate and disagreement in terms of um, the bilingual advantage theory. Now though that does not entirely negate the idea that bilingualism because the positive results are also results they are also valid results so are the negative results right. So positive going from positive results to the negative results with null result in between all of them are valid results. Then if all of them are true then what is happening? What is happening is probably that you need to look into a lot more number of finer variables than we have till now looked at. Now as a result of all of these latest researchers are now focusing on varied manifestations of the bilingual advantage. Many of these um, aforementioned conditions are now teased apart into more than one variables. Bilingual population now can be divided into bilingual migrant, bilingual non-migrant population, bi bilingual population di differing on SEAs, bilingual population differing on cultural closeness, linguistic closeness and so on. So the one idea of bilingualism can now be broken down to five different types of bilingual. So that is what we mean by that firm, uh, former conditions are now teased apart into more than one variable. And rather than a cross section analysis of different groups, longitudinal studies are also now coming up in a big way to see whether we can check the gradual impact of bilingualism on a population which starts from being monolingual to bilingual and do we see accompanying uh, changes in their uh, various kinds of um, cognitive control mechanisms. So now new theories are uh, coming up and that takes into account the behavioral ecology of the population. Behavioral ecology as in the experience, total experience of the bilingual uh, participants that are taken into consideration. So what kind of bilingual what it means to be a bilingual in different scenarios. For example, in the state of Assam, Bengali Assamese bilinguals are one group. Now, if we compare Bengali Assamese bilinguals executive control mechanism with that of Assamese English bilinguals, probably we will find different results. We will not be able to establish the same kind of findings. So that, but does it mean that the idea is not right? Probably not. Idea probably is right but we are simply comparing apples with oranges. So that is exactly what the new uh, domain of research is all about that we should take into account bilinguals in different scenarios and compare 
them within that scenario rather than across uh, in, in rather than in a cross sectional way so the bilingual experience is what is now uh, coming under focus very quite heavily is now uh, being investigated under various um, in various kinds of scenarios so the new areas as a result of all of these controversy all of these debates the new areas that have come up uh, new areas of research that has come up are uh, one of them is longitudinal studies then looking at the language use and the language switching context okay uh, and then distance between, between languages cultural setting weird versus non weird group um, they are not weird in any way this is just an abbreviation we will look into it uh, shortly uh, so these are some of the areas so in terms of longitudinal studies there have been uh, some studies that have taken place already and many others are going on now one study uh, have looked at two groups of children who start out as monolingual and then had um, different scores or uh, this, this, this is study study is basically a study that checks children's de development over a period of time. So, they all start out as monolingual have different levels of bilingual training and as a result of which they check their scores in intelligence. So, they had one year of uh, bilingual training the, within L2 immersion program. L2 immersion programs are, uh, are very um, uh, focused and um, uh, uh, immersed program where the, where the children will be trained in second language throughout. So, content as well as medium all will be second language. So, that is a very uh, strenuous uh, training in L2. So, these children went through one group of them went through uh, one year of L2 immersion program, the other group did not. Now, the comparison between these two groups showed that they, they scored differently on various scores of intelligence after one year. So, both groups started as monolingual, one group continued to be monolingual, the other group had one year of uh, training in L2. So, becoming bilingual and within that one year period at the end of one year, they had different scores of um, on intelligence. So, various uh, domains were found to be uh, affected, one of them is semantic, verbal fluency, cognitive control that they checked through Simon task and fluid intelligence which was checked through Raven's progressive color matrices. So, there are all these tasks that were used for these children and those children who went through a bilingual training who became bilingual over a period of one year started to show better performance on all of these tasks. So, this is a very important study. Uh, there are many other studies that are being uh, that are going on right now uh, typically pointing towards similar kind of findings. So, this is an example of Raven's matrices. This is a logical uh, kind of a study as to what which which of these pieces will get into uh, will fit in here. So, this is an example and it goes uh, progressively more difficult with each uh, trial. So, this is uh, a very common uh, task of intelligence um, common intelligence task for use for children. And a very important uh, theory that has come up in the recent time taking into account this bilingual experience is that of adaptive control hypothesis that, that came out in 2013. This theory links the frequency of language switching with performance on executive control. So, this theory takes it as a uh, baseline that being a bilingual itself does not guarantee executive control mechanism, uh, ex higher executive control uh, among bilinguals. But, uh, what probably is playing a role is the behavioral aspect of the bilingual language use which basically is about the language switching frequency, how often the bilinguals switch their languages. Because if you switch the languages only then there is a chance of having higher control mechanism being put to use. So, there are three switching contexts that the theory proposes. One is single language context, then dual language context and then dense code switching context. Single language context according to the theory says that the speaker uses one language in one environment. So, one language, one environment, persons when the people are bilingual, the participants are bilingual and they do use two languages, they do switch between two languages. However, there is no overlap, each language is used in its own particular context. So, one language at home, one language outside and so on. So, this is a very simple affair and this is called single language context. The other is called dual language context where both languages can be used but with different speakers. 
So, language switching here is not dependent on context, but it is dependent on speakers as to who the conversation partners are. So, it is not dependent on area, but on different different uh, different participants. So, switching may not occur within a sentence or an utterance. What happens in this case is that one has to be constantly alert for uh, any cue in the environment on the basis of which one might need to change. And then one there, there is the dense code switching context. Dense code switching context is speaker routinely mixes both languages in the course of a single utterance. Dense code switching context is uh, one where which we typically find in most Indian cities, urban uh, areas where we switch between the local language and English quite fluently. Absolutely there is, there is no re rhyme or reason actually. That is, it is not dependent on anything, it is just the way that people speak. So, the two languages are both are useful for any kind of given context, hence there is a very simple smooth uh, going back and forth between these two languages. So, that is called dense code switching context. Now, these kind of three uh, language switching contexts actually have different amount of uh, demand on the cognitive control mechanism. This is the figure that um, uh, this theory proposed that, that theory shows this uh, Green and Abu Talibis um, theory adaptive control hypothesis. So, this is the interactional context this is where the single language they are written like this SLC, DLC and dense code switching. Okay. So, this is the interactional context depending on these three kinds of interactional context, this will affect your speech pipeline as in what you speak depends on the context and then this in turn trains the control processes which ultimately leads to meta control processes, strengthening of the meta control processes. So, this is how it goes, interactional context affecting your speech output that kind of mechanism affecting your cognitive control processes which in turn strengthens your meta control processes. So, different different uh, kinds of uh, international context in terms of language switching leading to different levels of non-linguistic cognitive control. And uh, so, what is that cognitive control that we are talking about? Gin and Abu Talebe gives 8 types of cognitive control processes. These are the 8 types goal maintenance to opportunistic planning and then he shows how each of these linguistic uh, language switching context can train each of these different kinds of cognitive control. So, within the larger domain of cognitive control mechanism there uh, Gin and Abu Talebe brings out 8 different aspects and each of those aspects can be trained differently by each of those three different language switching context. So, to summarize in as per this SEH, the dual context trains the maximum number of these control mechanisms, the dual language context trains the maximum number of these controls. So, out of this 8, almost 5 or 6 are trained by the dual language context, whereas for single language context only a few control mechanisms are trained and dense code switching also similarly trains only a few of these control mechanisms. As a result of which what happens, bilinguals who live in a DLC language setup are expected to do better than the other context speakers in non-linguistic cognitive control tasks. Now, based on this hypothesis, researchers are now looking at interactional context as a variable and checking this out with the performance on different cognitive tasks. There have been a number of studies, um, so we will talk about only a few of them which are recent and they have looked at different uh, populations. So, study 1 has uh, looked at Singapore uh, bilingual children from Singapore. The tasks were inhibitory control and task switching on uh, to measure how executive function mechanism turns out in terms of uh, the language switching context. So, a battery of course uh, tasks they were also uh, tests were also designed to establish the code switching behavior of the participant. However, the, the results showed that code switching did not affect the performance. So, code switching context did not have, have any correlation with their performance as per this particular study. And the, uh, however, the degree of bilingualism whether they are balanced, unbalanced, high, low proficient bilinguals, these were 
found to be determining factors in this particular study carried out in 2019. So, the bilingual children they were different in terms of both code switching uh, practices, language switching um, uh, practices in their in their language use context as well as they were different in terms of whether they were high proficient, low proficient, balanced or unbalanced bilingual code switching context did not seem to affect their performance. In yet another study, they again on Singapore young adults this time, uh, they found out that um, they have also used uh, tasks on uh, inhibitory control, working memory and task switching. Uh, altogether, they used 9 tasks and um, they also devised a, a very uh, a new language uh, history questionnaire, language usage questionnaire that uh, takes into account the language used in different kinds of contexts and out of that and then the uh, contexts are you know, calculated. It is mathematically calculated to put uh, participants into single language, dual language and dense code switching um, uh, contexts. So, there are, so there is this questionnaire and there was the, there was this set of 9 tasks. What they found was that task switching performance uh, with greater exposure to dual language context actually was much better. People with dual language context background were actually doing better, found to be doing better in task switching, Any, all the tasks that required them to have a task switch. Yeah, and this was better than the single language users. And bilinguals in dense code switching context perform better in inhibition and goal maintenance tasks. So, this study finds a fine tune, much more finer uh, level of um, control mechanism with respect to all the three uh, language switching context. As a result of which, this uh, Hatanto and Young study in 2019 have now been replicated in many other places also and that questionnaire that they have created is also uh, now being used by many other groups. Study 3 uh, will uh, was carried out in 2020. They have looked at the uh, effect of switching frequency on attentional control and executive functioning. They used a different questionnaire altogether, different mechanism to divide the participants. They used a task which uh, uh, because of uh, use, using which they created this high frequency language switchers and low frequency language switchers groups. So, two groups and found they have uh, devised on this on the basis of a questionnaire and they also had a control group of monolinguals. The measures used to study uh, the attentional control was a uh, test of attentional performance TAP battery which had go no go cognitive flexibility subtest. There are all these different tests that they have used. It was uh, the study found out that the frequency of language switching did have an effect on the executive functioning. The high frequency switchers were found to be faster in their in the ta tasks on, on in the cognitive flexibility task as opposed to the low frequency. So, overall uh, barring one study, the other studies have found out that language switching if the bilinguals are in a context where they have to switch frequently between two languages based on different kinds of cues which is the dual code switching context, they are found to be doing better in different kinds of executive control related tasks. Study 4 again uh, 2020 this, this study was on uh, Finnish uh, Swedish bilinguals, they, um, they had tasks associated with inhibition and selective attention and uh, tasks related to working memory, higher rate of unintended language switching predicted worse performance right and whereas those who performed frequent but intended contextual switching had better performance in the tasks. So, this is the finding in these domain so far. And then we have uh, the weird versus non weird uh, sort of population. Now, weird versus non weird uh, populations have uh, were pointed out by uh, researchers recently that most of the findings in psycholinguistic studies, majority of psycholinguistic studies had the participants from western educated industrialized rich and democratic societies which is kind of basically what most western societies are. So, typical find typical studies will have university students as participants in those studies who take part in lieu of course credits. So, the majority of the studies, majority of the results are representative of the of a subset of western societies population. Now, this has this has 
uh, repercussions. This cannot be generalized and on, on the entire population of the whole world. The world has different kinds of societies, different kinds of population with all kinds of nuances inbuilt in different societies. So, how can a, a small group's performance be um, you know, mapped on to the rest of the population? So, as a result of which now there are uh, there is a call for uh, looking at populations from non weird countries as in the non western non rich non democratic and you know all these with different kinds of countries there there are a lot of um, variants for example countries like india can offer a lot of uh, in important insights of bilingual uh, language control as well as bilingual control on executive functions countries like india where multilingualism is the norm in western societies still very recently monolingualism was the norm bilingualism has become uh, more common only recently but in countries like many asian countries african countries multilingualism is the norm even today it as it has been for years for for uh, hundreds of years so there have there are bound to be differences as a result of which now uh, many uh, studies are coming up with um, uh, this kind of participants in mind and we are now beginning to see different kinds of results that challenge the earlier findings similarly a new recent phenomena of a large scale migration into western countries have given rise to um, the another domain of study within bilingualism is that of migrant versus non-migrant population majority of these bilingual population in the western countries are migrants so when we look at uh, let's say uh, chinese english bilingual those chinese are not native chinese of the of the place or uh, no spanish english bilinguals or in the more recent times uh, uh, let's say um, ethiopian english ethiopian uh, speaking with different varieties of arabic and english and so on so there is there are differences here so migrant non migrant difference has to be also looked at that is again yet another uh, domain that has come up so we will conclude this part this section with some recent findings from india keeping all of these various new variables into uh, into account so uh, some studies investigating cognitive control mechanism in by bi different bilingual uh, populations have looked at the role of culture cue culturally specific cues on the language control as well as executive control mechanisms so culturally specific cues are a uh, very interesting domain of research that have found out uh, that in the culture specific cues have an in uh, has a negative impact on language production so chinese english bilingual studies have shown that if the participants see a chinese face and they have to use english language uh, produce english language there is an impact so incongruent um, cultural cues affects um, their L2 more significantly as opposed to L1, but the con incongruent uh, conditions do have an impact. This is one domain that has been replicated in many uh, in couple of Indian uh, studies. In one case, the Bengali English bilinguals were studied and they found similar impact. So, this study was uh, like this. This is um, what they used. This is a prime. This, uh, this is the picture of Howrah Bridge and they, this was a production study. The prime here was a culture specific cue. So, there are different pictures that were there in the background and the study was a production study. So, the a picture will appear and the participant has to name, name the picture. The uh, all the while the cue the, the prime remains in the background. In some cases the target language is English, in some cases the target language is Bengali and they found a, an impact of the incongruent uh, conditions. So, congruency had uh, facilitating uh, effect. So, when the um, picture, the picture and the language to be used were the same then uh, belonging to the same culture, there was facilitation when there was an incongruency, there was a negative impact and the impact was also found to be more on L2. This is in line with the Chinese English studies that we have talked about. However, there have been other studies also that looked at similar kind of um, uh, priming that using cultural specific culture specific cues and try to see how culture specific cues affect language control as well as other executive control mechanisms. However, now uh, these studies have found different results that there was uh, no impact found of the incongruent condition on the language uh, output.
there were some studies carried out on Rongme Metei and Ao Sangtam bilinguals. Both of these uh, groups are in Northeast India. And the interesting difference in this study is that uh, from the previous study is that both of these languages are local languages, uh, unlike earlier Bengali English. So, English is not a local language. However, Rongme Metei and uh, Ao Sangtam, both all of these languages are spoken in the nearby region. So, both are in the all of these are indigenous languages all of these four are indigenous languages and here we do not find this study did not find any impact of the incongruent condition. However, when the, the researcher looked at how English bilinguals if to see if it is about, a, about the language pair or it is something else, they actually found impact the similar way that the Chinese English as well as the Bengali English population showed. So, it, it turns out the probability that linguistic and cultural distance between the language 1 and language 2 between L1 and L2 of the bilinguals are important issues to look into. So, the same participants will sh do not show impact of incongruent uh, condition in L2 when the languages are indigenous, but they show the impact when the L2 is non-indigenous. So, one of these studies, the Rome Mathi studies did used uh, the culture specific dresses uh, in the northeast in India, um, all of these the, in the study was carried out in Nagaland. So, in uh, Nagaland and Manipur, the, the in the northeast, most of these uh, indigenous communities, the indigenous groups have their specific dress. So, this dress has uh, this is uh, specific to each of the tribes. So, their dress will have different patterns, different color um, uh, mapping, and so on. So, which is unique to only that culture, only that group. Hence, this study used the um, dresses uh, on cartoonized pictures of humans and uh, one particular study used um, uh, uh, translation equivalent recognition. So, the first word was uh, in uh, L1 and the second in L2 and vice versa and there was this uh, cue that comes in between. Sometimes this was a wrong made dress, sometimes it was a meta dress. This particular is a wrong made dress. Now, this uh, the study looked at how much the in the prime the dress impacts the language output and they found there was no significant impact. So, incongruent cultural uh, incongruent conditions did not have any inhibition on the output. The study also looked at um, language switching context uh, and its impact on um, executive control mechanisms. So, what they found was that dual language uh, context participants incurred less switch cost than the SLC participants. So, this is in line with the other findings where we um, where bilinguals who live in the dual language context are showing finer control on the executive control mechanism. And this study also found that they incurred less interference cost in the incongruent condition in ANT as well and um, were able to respond faster than the SLC participants. So, basically overall this study found that the dual the DLC participants had much higher executive control put in place as opposed to the monolingual participant uh, uh, as opposed to the single language con context participants. So, this um, these are some of the recent Indian studies that have um, I looked at these issues that have been um, that have been um, put forward by researchers all over the world and the research in this domain is only beginning to take shape uh, with different kinds of participants. However, we see that uh, once we take into account differences in cul cultural larger cultural social uh, context into the into the into the when we, we build them into the design we do see different kinds of results. So, to summarize bilingualism is beneficial in terms of higher executive control mechanism in certain cases. However, there are some finer aspects within the bilingual experience that is now currently under uh, investigation. So, we do not completely negate the bilingual advantage. However, we need to look at the finer nuances within the bilingual, the behavioral ecology of bilingual experience. And that is where we probably will have better answer as to why some bilinguals do show the advantage whereas some bilinguals do not. And uh, as we have just seen some of the Indian uh, studies are now beginning to look at those nuances at different levels of uh, whether depending on cultural closeness, linguistic closeness and language, language switching context.
there are some advantages of bilingualism too there are some studies which have found bilingual uh, advantage, disadvantages of bilingualism uh, um, primarily in case of language related issues of uh, vocabulary size and grammaticality and so on and thirdly there are some areas where there are no difference at all so areas of human cognition which seem to be indifferent to bilingualism so to in a nutshell bilingualism has a good bad and indifferent results. So, here we come to the end of this particular segment. Um, there are references at the end which you one can look up for uh, all of these papers that we have discussed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.